fucking forgot that they were even playing my morning song because they've been jamming. And then we're high going, oh my God, it's still that fucking song. He said, that's how I feel about podcasts. <laughs> so I would like to say that that Kevin Smith was right. Now, do you mind if I ask you some questions? Uh, but you, really quick, Buddy Hackett, I went to his house. It's me, you, and Jeff Ross and his lovely wife, Sherry. Now, when we sat Shiva, the Jews have everybody come to the house and then you sit Shiva for how long? It's normally two nights that you do it. I thought it was longer than that. Well, some people do it for the whole week, but it's two nights that are the... So everyone that Hackett knew, like Buddy Epson, uh, Bob Newhart, Harvey uh, Corman, you thought I was going to say cartel, it's very sad that Buddy Hackett had to die. <laughs> what the fuck was Joe thinking? To hire a fucking maniac like that and turn it into a goddamn shooting gallery. <laughs> bam, bam, buddy, you are shot in the gut. It hurts bad. But you don't die from your wounds. Larry, I don't care how mad you are at me. That's not half as mad as daddy's going to be at us. Let's move some cars. It looks like Sam's hot car lot out there. By the way, every housewife and gay person and people that come here from bravotv.com and uh, all my uh, Picture Perfect fans, uh, I appreciate you bearing with us having no idea what we're talking about for segments at a time, but that's the way it goes. It's ADD. So Buddy Hackett sits Shiva. We go to Buddy Hackett's house. I pull up the driveway. There are literally about 400 people in the Hackett house on Whittier Street. He's got that big elephant in his front yard, and the elephant's trunk is down. Which is bad luck. That's what I told him. He goes, you know, every fucking person that comes to my house goes, you know, an elephant with his trunk down is bad luck. And I go, let me tell you something. I've been on four safaris, and I spent at least six months in Africa. <laughs> I never once saw an elephant walking around with his fucking trunk up and being happy. <laughs> they just walk. That's how they act. What do you want from me? <laughs> and then I thought about it. Never once have you seen a fucking elephant at the Bronx Zoo walking down the goddamn street with his fucking head like, well, that elephant is obviously happy. Look at his trunk. I think they're confusing it with erections. <laughs> I go to Hackett's house, and then really quick I'll tell this, and then we'll get, tell a story about how I got us an owl or whatever Katz wants to ask me. I pull my truck up, and uh, I was going through a very odd part of my life. I was very unhappy. I was drinking a lot. I had a giant Escalade with spinning rims on it. Like, what, what fucking douchebag. Like, that's something that happens in the Inland Empire. Not like a person with actual an, a long IMDP page. Like, nah, man, I'll just pull up, listen to fucking Outcast with my spinning rims to Buddy Hackett's sitting shiva. I get out of the truck, and all these old, old timers, incredible, and Jeff Ross, and we're all there, and it's incredibly sad. He died, he died too young, and he had so much more to give. He was going back out on stage. Bob Newhart, who I met on Saturday Night Live, meets me at my truck. I open the truck uh, door, and when I step down at the Hackett's driveway, Bob Newhart standing exactly in front of me, and he goes, "Hey, uh, Jay, I'm, I'm. Thank God you're here. I thought I was going to have to spend the day uh, talking to Harvey Corman." <laughs> <laughs> and Bob Newhart, by the way, uh, his wife uh, was introduced to him by Buddy Hackett, and also oddly shot fake George Harrison. <laughs> but it's uh, the fact that Bob Newhart sought me out because Harvey Corman was making him fucking crazy. <laughs> Bob Thank God Newhart. you're here. I thought I was going to have to spend the day talking to Harvey Corman. My inspiration, Bob Newhart. But I got questions to ask you. Do you mind if I flip the no, switch? No, I don't here? mind at all. But I mean, we should probably, uh, yeah, we should probably talk about how I got SNL because you just explained how Tracy got SNL and how Maceo and Royale did not get mm -hmm. SNL. Because it did involve you, and I did talk about you a lot in my book, Asking for Airtime. And people ask me, how do you get into movies? How do you get into – and I, I never have an answer for them because I'm a comic who did comedy enough times well where people came to see me and then they said, hey, why don't we go see that guy do comedy? Maybe we could put him in a movie, it's, which is how we got to Jerry Maguire, which we'll talk about in the next podcast. Come on, I'll make a note of that. So I tell them – my I'm a comedian and my manager owned a comedy club. Now, if you're coming from that point – if you're starting from there – I can help you. But unless your manager owns a comedy club and he can invite agents and producers and casting agents to come see you do comedy, I don't fucking know how to get into the show business. Uh, hey, I really want to be an actor. I don't Move to L.A., be a fucking waiter at the Olive Garden because we're all family. How are your breadsticks? I don't know how that shit works at all. And I'm not being a dick. Like I really have no idea how to get into comedy, how to get into acting. And what I tell people is – uh, you know, the sad thing is this great fucking Aristotle quote that I apply almost daily. We all know it only because that fucking lummox Shaquille O'Neal made it famous. 
Big Aristotle, man is what he continually does. Man is what he continually does. So if you want to go do comedy and be a comic, you better get out there and keep fucking doing it. Do it at steakhouses. Do it in line at the fucking DMV. Todd Glass used to drive around in his Jeep with a sound system in the back and park it at Huntington Beach at the dog park parking lot and do fucking comedy from his truck, like from his Jeep. You just got, look at the game tape. You, how the fuck you going to be great if you don't study greatness? So Barry calls me and says he's having Saturday Night Live auditions at his comedy club. Now, this is extraordinary news. But the curveball in this news is that the comedy club Barry owns is arguably the biggest shithole in North America. <laughs> and Frank's Comedy Warehouse. It is like fucking Penn Station if they just pulled the buses out and put fucking 40 random Puerto Rican and black people in the village with no air conditioning. Yo, make me laugh, nigga, you corny. Next That's to the black f- man ne- number six. Take a shot. <laughs> next to the firehouse in El Molino. Right next between an Italian restaurant where mobsters would do their deals, allegedly, and the firehouse. So you'd be in the middle of your act and they would get a fucking call. <laughs> Nothing cuts into a fucking Christopher Walken impression. <laughs> a fucking fire truck going by. Jay, continue your story. There'll be much more of me in later podcasts. <laughs> That's all you get this time. So Barry Katz has Marcy Klein, uh, I believe Ryan Shiraki, who also produces 30 Rock now, and a few other people. This is sort of like the AAA audition before you get to the bigs, before you get your cuts in the bigs. If you do well at Barry Katz's Comedy Club, which was called the Boston Comedy Club, and only a fucking moron like Barry Katz would open a comedy club. Thank, thank you, Jay. Would open a comedy club in Manhattan and call it the Boston Comedy Club, <laughs> surrounded by NYU potheads staggering around looking at the sign, going, "Wait, what? Where the fuck are we?" And made it work for twenty years. You did make it work if you don't count ticket sales and the bar. <laughs> <laughs> if you just eliminate the bar and ticket sales. That really was the model of success. <laughs> I go, hey, nobody's getting paid. I remember I told you this once. I go, can I get like a stipend? Like, can you toss me 20 bucks, 50 bucks? He goes, man, it's not about the money, man. It's about you guys having a really great, safe place to go up there and try out all your material. I go, so you're not paying anybody? He goes, no. <laughs> and in hindsight, he was right. That was the only place in Manhattan where you would see – myself I'm not speaking about myself in the third person just for the listener and if you're transcribing this I don't know it makes for easier text for Jay Moore literally it would be Jay Moore Dave Chappelle Nick DiPaolo Jim Norton Red Johnny and the Round Guy who were a fucking monster comedy team Wanda Sykes Wanda Sykes Hall Keith Robinson Rich Vaughn like back to back to back to back to back and this is every night and like Tuesday through Sunday and in front of during the week maybe 15, 20 people, and we would wind up just shitting on each other. So I get the call from Katz. He's having a Saturday Night Live <clears throat> audition. By, by the way, I just want to say this, is that uh, uh, Jay would never admit to this, but Jay was the guy that all the young comics looked at and said, how do I get to be like this guy? Now, when did that change? When did I be- <laughs> Well, let's just talk about when this. When did I become when, the guy when, that when, when, when Chappelle came in, he told me right away, and he's told me since when I've seen him, is when I got to that man, comedy. Hey, more, man. When I got to that comedy Seven. club, he was the kind of he was the kind of guy. He had the confidence, he had the look, he had the power, and he would booked acting jobs before everything that we wanted to do. And uh, and we always looked at him like that's the guy we got to take down. That's the guy we got to take over. We got to go. We got to pass this guy. We got to get to his level. Well, it's safe to say they've all passed me. <laughs> no, they haven't. Yes, they have. I'm in my garage doing a fucking podcast. <laughs> Frank Caliendo's got a hundred million dollar deal in Vegas. I I personally I would not want to commute from Phoenix to Vegas three times. I digress. <laughs> Uh, but it is odd. Adam Carolla once asked me, what is it about you, Jay, that makes other comics so begrudging to admit that you're funny? And I said, and I really thought about it, and he expounded on it. He said, more than any other comic I've ever met in my life, and I bet this goes down in Kevin's circle as well. Like, you go, you just say the name Patton Oswalt, and people go, he's the fucking best. But, you know, I would like to think that my stand-up show is probably a cut above not taking anything away from patent just i think what i'm doing is a little more exciting and great and like uh just 
all that alternative crowd and even people like Louis and, and like, uh, like Voss, like all these guys, like, what is it about you where when I, hold on, when I say J and this is what Adam Carolla said, he's pretty good barometer of, in my opinion of comedy. Cause I respect him a lot. He said, when I bring your name up, people are reluctant to say he's hilarious. And I'll go, no, you don't understand. He was just here. And for an hour, the place he wrote, like we just, the walls went away like we were on acid and we laughed like crazy people. And they go, yeah, you know. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. He walked out that door an hour ago and no one's ever come in and just fucking dominated and crushed it. What is it about you where people are reluctant to just say, he is one of the funniest fucking guys. And I interrupted him. I go, I used to be a colossal asshole. And that seemed to totally like take him off his game. Like he didn't expect me to just go because I was a dick and I treated people like I was a dick. And you, what made me link to that uh, idea was you said the word confidence and my wife and I still have this conversation and she says, you, you're so confident. Like if you go out and host the NHL awards, you walk out there and it's not a swagger because you know me better than any, you really do know me better than anybody. And you'll get to know me better than anybody, aside from my wife. And that's because I've been inside of her. <laughs> I've been alongside you, but I've never been inside. I've never been. <laughs> Episode eight. Hopefully, fingers crossed, people. Jay goes inside, deep inside Barry. Uh, and she said, you have such confidence. And it's not a swagger. It's not like I'm better than everybody. But when you walk out on stage with that much, like you overflow confidence, people without it, it really bothers them and it's off-putting and it's offsetting. They want to see you like, woo, this is a pretty big deal right now. But my MO has always been go out there. Don't let them see you sweat. Don't let them know that right before the curtain comes up on the NHL awards two years in a row, I'm having a fucking heart attack. And I'm thinking to myself, am I going to fucking pass out on television? Is the Versus Network going to leapfrog fucking Comedy Central and cable views because I died on stage? I'm terrified. But I've always been told, fake it in that book. Life, what was that great book back in the day? Life's Little Instruction Book. And the guy gave advice to his son like, if you're ever in a fight, hit first, hit hard. Over tip breakfast waitresses. If you're scared or nervous, fake it. No one will know the difference. That's the one that I always kept in my head. So I don't know what it is. What it is, it's like this is the thing. It's being an asshole. It's being confident. And it's booking the fucking jobs right away when other people could never figure it out because comedians don't – there's a muscle. There's different muscles for comedy. There's different muscles for acting. You had the innate muscle for acting and knowing how to walk into a room with a casting director director and just getting the gig right away and they hated you for that. So not only were you booking the jobs and smiling and laughing All and right. making money, but you were a dick to them. Right. And that's that's the key phrase. Is I was a dick to them. Yes, because you look at a guy like Louis C.K. He who, was, but he he was a slow. Louis was a slow, like a plane taking off, and he's still taking off. It's like you right. now took I'm, off I'm like a rocket. I'm definitely on. I'm 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 five months away from doing Dancing with the Stars. Let's be <laughs> honest here. Let's call a spade a spade. Let's, that's not number eight. That's a real expression. <laughs> I don't think that's accurate. But uh, uh so. That's the thing is the confidence and these guys that you mentioned that said they wanted to be like me, if I could change anything about me, you know, I've told you this thousands of times. The one thing you tell people listening to more stories podcast, you're listening to more stories podcast. I'm Jay Moore. Cohen is our engineer producer. He's our Brian Eno. He's our flood. This today an and example. Barry, oh, real quick, and Barry Katz is my guest. He's uh, been my manager and my very good friend for a super, super long time. And for my initial podcast, I thought, why not have the guy that knows me better than anybody else instead of me trying to do some half-assed interview? And then when I get the hang of it, I'll bring in like uh, real guests. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's the thing: is you treat people, you're an asshole to people with their confidence, and they don't know you're breaking their balls. I just had a talk with Brewer on the phone, like Brewer said shit about me on the radio, on, on uh, a New York radio when we were both out promoting stuff. And they go, your buddy Jim Brewer's coming in tomorrow. I go, Brewer's the best. One of the just great, great, like, here, when you hit, you hit a certain age where all you care about is are they nice? Like, we're all funny in our own way. That's what's amazing about comedy. You can be carrot top pulling shit out of a fucking suitcase. You can be Stephen Wright saying a sentence every four minutes. 
You could be me telling stories. You could be, but we're all doing the same 